Yeah? yeah? Right? Yes. Yeah. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. And we're here. Hey, Frederick Mitchell, how are you doing today? I'm good, Jam. How's it going with you, man? Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, not the nicest day, but on the other hand, it makes me feel better about being in the office, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, same here. You're hiding from the thunderstorms in your basement. Uh, that's what you told that's me. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, yeah, for those who don't know, yes, I am in my basement. This is my impetus to actually get my basement finished. So if I force myself to work down here on cold and dreary days, it'll push me to kind of, okay, eventually get this all done. So <laughs> plus well, it scares my little kids. So <laughs> so they, they, they stay out of your way. That's right. Well, you, you, it's good to start with the uh, Ikea curtains there. So, you know. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So this is another session at Jam's virtual Drupal camp, and I'm really excited to have Frederick Mitchell with me. Frederick has been doing a great session at a few events, and uh, he and I caught up at NYC camp in New York, and um, I love this idea, and I'm really, really excited, and I didn't have time to see it when we were in New York, so um, basically, for completely selfish reasons, you see, I can dedicate an hour of my day now um, while you do this session for me. Thank you very much Excellent. for coming. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I mean, as you know, in open source and specifically with Drupal, it's all about sharing the knowledge. So I'm, I'm happy to do this at any time. I appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to know a little bit more about you. Do you have a first, do you have a first Drupal memory? Uh, my first Drupal memory actually, um, so, was was actually at Palantir. I used to work at Palantir, and um, back in the day at Palantir, it was uh, just Krell and I. So my first Drupal memory was actually trying to absorb all of Larry's kind of eagerness and enthusiasm about Drupal 5 at the time and trying to really understand, like, you know, what this is. And, of course, as I opened the Pandora's box and tried to follow, you know, the direction he was going, it kind of opened my eyes and, you know, got really excited. I've been kind of running ever since then. So, <laughs> um, Larry, that, so, so you and Larry were the developers at Palantir at that point? Yeah, a long time ago when they were a lot smaller. Um, yeah, it, it had gotten to the point where, um, I mean, we had front end developers, but I think at the time in terms of like the back end stuff, um, yeah, it was Larry and myself and, um, we were just starting to really kind of, accelerate into Drupal. We, at that time, had a homegrown CMS. We were supporting some other off-the-shelf stuff, but we really were kind of, you know, going in that direction, so. Now you are senior developer at Phase 2, and um, Phase 2 does a lot of cool work. Uh, describe your, um, describe your, what you do at your day job. Sure. So, yeah, right now I'm, I'm kind of a man that wears a lot of different hats um, at Phase 2. So, Phase 2, we specialize in um, you know, build using Drupal as a, as a platform, not just a, not just a kind of building a regular site. So we support a lot of different um, enterprise clients, nonprofit clients, um, government clients. And right now, my day to day in a job is working with developers, working with analysts, um, user experience folks, front end folks, the client, and making sure the architecture um, meets the vision that they're looking for. So we have a lot of discovery conversations. We have a lot of strategic um, kind of projection conversations of what you're looking for in the middle term, the long term, you know, where Drupal is going. And then, of course, you know, if they have an existing site, um, most of my clients have a Drupal 7 site and they're considering Drupal 8, you know, we'll talk about, okay, what kind of architecture decisions are we making right now to kind of prepare for that? Um, again, kind of building tools for the various user roles, whether it's a site administrator who wants to connect disparate systems to a content creator who wants to create various campaigns within their platform. So it's kind of a little bit of, of everything, but I, but I like it a lot. So uh, That last part certainly um, ties in with a conversation I had with Pam Barone from previous Next in Australia, where she talked about 
designing sites with the end user in mind, but then she immediately pointed out that um, the end user is not only the potential customer, people you want to sell things to, people who go to your site, but the end user, uh, the other end user, the, maybe the more important end user for her is the content editor and creator. And the person has to live inside the guts of the thing every day and trying to make their working experience, uh, you know, uh, a pleasant one and not just what got thrown together or, you know, in the world of proprietary where she worked before as a content editor, if you needed to make a change to the back end interface for the CMS, it would either cost tens of thousands of dollars or it wasn't even possible. So, <laughs> right. I had this realization actually that w when we were talking that there's the, the, the end user is, is not the end user. You know, you have all those different people that you're working for as, as you were just describing. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And, and the key is, you know, what, what is going to reap the maximum value at that time? If, if the, if the, focus of the organization, right, is their, their outwardly facing audience, whether it's a customer to someone you want to actually do some sort of interaction. So in the case of a nonprofit, if you're looking for people to donate or engage or volunteer, right, the maximum amount of value is, okay, what are you projecting to that audience? Well, as the other case in that same nonprofit scenario, you may have more business value because that message is already tailored. People already know that brand already. There may be more value in actually building tools for an internal team for them to be able to manipulate and do certain things um, to, to meet that audience. So they may have, you know, something in meat space already, right, that engages um, their, their donors or their grantees, but they're looking for a set of tools within their Drupal system or some other systems that connect to, um, to their Drupal site to again facilitate um, those interactions that they already kind of know the direction they want. For example, microsite building to campaign building to you know, creating some sort of um, really personalized and niche interaction where after someone donates, they can immediately share or bring in other people to kind of um, relive and enjoy the experience that they're doing. So it's pretty cool. Like I said, it's, it's very challenging. Um, again, mainly because you have to be that interpretation between, okay, what they're looking for and what is technically possible. And then of course, you know, what fits in the budget at that time, so. <laughs> So phase two does a lot of work with um, right. government, yeah. NGO, uh, nonprofits, that kind of thing. How is it bringing open source to, to these kind of clients nowadays? Um, it's great, actually. I mean, you know, um, we, were, we were part of the, um, the original kind of White House.gov build and, and the We the People petition system that they use to kind of, you know, get the kind of democratization of ideas and, and get that whole thing. So that really, at least I personally feel it opened up this conversation of, you know, what open source was, the security of open source, and what it really meant in terms of, you know, democratic principles. And of course, in the land of politics, you know, uh, perception is, is important. So it's been actually great. I, I was, um, I actually was the, the lead developer um, at one point on the energy.gov project. So that was one of the first Drupal 7 sites that started, you know, two or three years ago. And what that ended up actually being was, you know, it, it fit all of the kind of political check boxes. One, it was going to save money. Two, it brought, you know, various um, offices under the Department of Energy under the same kind of branding. Three, they didn't have kind of the recurring licenses. And then four, because it was open source and because we could manipulate it, we could custom tailor, again, those content authoring, you know, experiences and those tools to the needs of the various offices while still having that kind of super administrator and allowing that person to kind of control, you know, what needed to be controlled, whether it's moving something from PDF into actual web documents to, you know, workflow of various um, press releases to even, you know, um, helping um, bubble up certain ideas depending upon a campaign. So we've, you know, we've had a lot of information about, you know, the loans the Department of Energy gave to Tesla to the Yucca Mountain stuff, to all these other things, and being able to have, um, be basically being able to enable, you know, government officials to help them get their message out, and so people can figure out, okay, what is going on, what were the details of, of those, um, of of those pieces of um, of interactions, of those events, you know, you know, it's a public service. So, for, from my experience, and again, we're continuing to work with the Senate, we're working with the House of Representatives. It's been absolutely great because they, you know, everyone kind of understands at this point in 2014 that 
open transparency, open source, democratization. I mean, they all kind of have a single kind of underlying thread. So. All right. It's nice to see that there is uh, an acknowledgement of our values and practices in open source, um, the, 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 the belief in and the putting into practice of transparency, right, and of, of a, some sort of meritocracy. And, you know, you're free to use study, modify, share. It really empowers us a lot. And, and um, it's great to hear that people have really taken that on board. Can you talk about the priorities or the special needs that a government client might have, um, especially if, they, if they're different perhaps from what, uh, what someone who's used to dealing with other sorts of enterprise businesses or what have you, what's, what's different about doing government work? Um, I would say it's, the only difference really is, you know, just kind of knowing your audience. I mean, um, a lot of times, again, because um, various offices have budgets, various offices have different stakeholders, you know, you really want to kind of understand the impact of, you know, the various audiences that, that can go into um, who's going to be using the tool. So that could be from, you know, the various experience levels regarding technology and being able to um, adapt or update specific content to, again, kind of understanding, okay, what is, what is going to be the, the, the biggest amount of value for what this particular office is looking for. Um, in certain examples, again, as I was saying, like the Department of Energy had a lot of different offices. So there was a lot of conversation about, okay, so a hundred so offices have a hundred different budgets when it comes to their web technology. And we're trying to, you know, standardize that in terms of a branding and in terms of a single platform. Um, you know, that specific challenge, um, specifically with government was, okay, we know that this is going to be a long process, right? Because there's going to have to be conversations. There needs to be a lot of room for questions of answering. There's going to be a pilot program. Um, you know, there's going to be some opportunities where we can have some discussions to defend some of our decisions, also being very open. Um, and so that's a little bit different than, you know, a nonprofit or corporate entity where it may be kind of a top-down approach where because um, a specific timeline or an event or a budget is driving decisions. And so, you know, a board gets together and they decide, okay, this is what we're going to do and we need to have it done by this time because this is this other thing that's, that's, that's part of that. You know, that kind of long, um, again, kind of democratized discussion of, okay, this office is going to do this. We're going to pilot this. We're going to get everyone's feedback of what this is actually going to be. And then we're going to share those results. And then people are going to be able to see like, okay, this worked, this didn't work. How do we change? How do we pivot, et cetera? You know, it's really unique about, about you know, doing government projects. But again, from, from my perspective, I feel like that's, that's kind of what it's about. You know, it's a constantly evolving and changing thing. And the fact that you start with an open source system like Drupal just kind of feeds right into what it's all about, which is, to your point, right, you fork, you modify, you share, and then you just kind of, you know, move on from there and continue to improve. So, okay, so the so the government working culture to some extent it, it reflects uh, this sort of working processes and, and evolution that that we go through within within our within our open source projects. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely, and and, and it's it, right. There's pros and cons to that, right? Because a lot of times, certain people feel like it may not be moving fast enough, right? You hear that kind of old adage: "When is Drupal whatever going to be ready?" And, you know, Larry famously says, when it's ready, and it's, it's kind of the same thing, right? You want it to be right. You want people to feel like they can contribute, but you also want to make progress in kind of incremental steps. And sometimes you kind of take big leaps to get a good pilot process out there so people can kind of pick it apart, touch it and play with it and, and manipulate it. And other pieces, you know, we just set, you know, a goal and we just continually, continuously improve it and keep adding pieces to it. Absolutely. Hmm. So last two questions. Um, I think. Sure. What um, <laughs> what are you most excited about in Drupal 8? Um, to be quite honest, I'm, I'm again, my, my background's in engineering, so I'm, I'm more about the kind of the nuts and bolts pieces, but I'm really excited about, you know, the integration with Symfony. Um, you know, I've been following a lot of the conversation um, that was talked about um, going in this direction. I think I've learned a lot. I mean, when you jump into other languages, whether it's Ruby or Python or, you know, Java or what have you, 
you know, the object oriented principles, how packages are included, the namespacing, all the different stuff. Those all are, those, those, those have been, those have existed for a while. The fact that now, you know, this framework and the CMS that I, that I enjoy so much is going to be using that a lot more for me kind of makes it a lot easier for me to jump and it's, it's a lot more efficient learning. So I'm really excited to kind of translate, you know, what I've learned in terms of the Drupal way and, you know, the different principles of PHP, where PHP is going in 5.5, 5.6, et cetera, and actually seeing those manifestations again in something as popular and as powerful as Drupal, because I feel like that's just going to make me, you know, a better, you know, engineer. So I love um, learning efficiency is a, is a, I'm not sure I've heard that term specifically before, but that, no, but it makes, but it also, it, um, I think learning efficiency is, is all over Drupal 8, you know, the, in, the unification of the internal systems and, you know, base classes and uh, there's, um, there are more layers to the system, right? But once you understand how everything works, there is, you know, rough, there are many, many fewer ways to do things because, you know, all the internal uh, CRUD operations are the same across the systems and so on. So I think, you know, actually, uh, I've been talking to a bunch of people who said, uh, what was it, Brent? Brent Wynn in Chicago sure. said, said, um, oh, to learn Drupal 7 really well, I had to take a weekend for each internal system and study it. And right. then I got on top of that, and then when I needed to know another one, then I would spend the next weekend doing that. And he said, I spent maybe a three-day weekend looking at Drupal 8 internals, but now I feel I know 80, 90% of the system, and all I need to do is like learn the special flavor of, of the particular subsystem. You know, it's what it does, uh, what it's, what it's uh, sorry, what its specialty is. Right, exactly. And that's, and I think that's the point, right? We want to, you know, not invent the wheel every time we do an upgrade, every time we do a particular system. You know, I think, again, going back to, you know, Larry's point, you know, the pie philosophy probably invented elsewhere. And that's, that's really cool. I mean, you know, the whole thing, in, again, inside the PHP community of packages and um, composer, barring libraries, I mean, that's, that's what's done in Ruby. That's what's done in Python. That's what's done in Java. I mean, there's there's just these commonalities are there in terms of you know using packages, having a package manager, and being able to use those namespaces you know when you need them. It, that's just how it's done, um, and it makes a lot of sense for us to kind of you know not jump on the bad wagon, but align ourselves in those interests because now we can cross learn. And again, like I said, the learning efficiency. And to be quite honest, that's exactly what my presentation is about. Is like okay, how do you take what you knew from Drupal seven? Here's some things, and here's the new hotness and some of these functions are now called this so okay awesome so what what word what word best describes drupal open 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 that is a good answer now um for those of you listening to the aquia podcast the podcast is going to wind down now thank you frederick mitchell for taking the time to talk with me today Absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity. And if you want to see and hear Frederick's session, go on over to aquia.com slash podcasts, find the page for this podcast, and embedded on that page you will find his full session and uh, his slides embedded or linked as well. So come on over and check that out. Thanks for listening to the podcast, and see you soon. Great. Thank you so much. Have a good day. All right. Take care, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.